Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. You can go ahead and turn to James chapter 3. We'll be finishing chapter 3 this morning. Um, just a little announcement. My phone broke this week, so if you've been trying to get a hold of me for any reason and I haven't been answering, that's the reason. Um, I should have a new one on Tuesday. I should. <laughs> we've seen so far in the book of James for the challenge it's been please help us not to allow the difficulty of what you ask us to do cause it to bounce off us to make us think we'll never achieve that help us to respond in faith to trust in you more deeply for the strength that we need to live for you. Remind us that none of this is anything that we can accomplish in our own reach. Help everything I say to be in accordance with your word. And help our understanding to be more than just mental, but for it to touch our lives, to affect the way that we think and the way that we act. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. That Rehoboam, son of Solomon, the man to whom the book of Proverbs is addressed, if you think of it, gave to the nation of Israel after Solomon's death. And with this single act of folly, the man to whom the book of Proverbs is addressed and all of the wisdom he was doing, when I read this passage. But if you read a little further, it says that Rehoboam was 41 years old when he became king. Twice as old as Solomon had been. His words were foolish, but also they were not rash. They were not impulsive. He didn't lose his temper and speak in haste when he was the wisdom from this earth. You have to remember that three days before this, the assembly of Israel had come before Rehoboam, led by a man named Jeroboam, a known rebel, somebody that Solomon had banished from the country. And they had essentially said people, that's how they phrased it, be a servant to this people. And to grant their petition. But those closest to Rehoboam all agreed these people are acting this way because they think you are a weak ruler. You have to prove them wrong. You have to assert your authority. Or they are going to walk all over you. And even worse, most likely, they pointed out, this way. There is a wisdom from below. And there is a wisdom from above. The difference between the two is very simple and easy to recognize if you know how to see it, how to recognize it. The problem is that earthly advice sounds so natural in our earthly ears that we often accept it without even thinking about it. And heavenly wisdom sounds to us like foolishness. It sounds irresponsible showing them how they ought to behave if they really trust in Christ. We saw that a wise Christian obediently applies the word of God to their life. They show love to everyone, ignoring worldly distinctions. They demonstrate their faith in God by what they do. They act on his promises. And they bridle their tongues. They use their tongues to bless and not to damage those around them. For the disease, not for the symptoms. He's using the symptoms to point out the disease. To point out the fact that our thinking is wrong. And that's the focus of the passage before us. James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. Next week we're going to see that if our thinking is wrong, it's because of the two completely opposite ways of thinking at war within every Christian's mind. And if we are ever to become pleasing to God, 
we must learn to recognize one side from the other and begin to fight on the side of God. So James opens this section, Who among you is wise and under who is skilled in the art of applying God's truth to your life and living in a way that pleases Him? If you answered yes to that question, then James isn't going to tell you outright that you're wrong, but he is going to be very suspicious. Have you ever known someone truly wise and spiritually mature? Have you ever heard them say, you know anything that he has not yet known as he ought to know? When I graduated Bible school about 13 years ago, I knew pretty much everything there was to know. The smartest man alive. I was going to change the world with my ideas. I wasn't going to be a pastor, but I was going to write books probably that were going to blow people's minds with all of my original ideas. I was going to settle disputes that had been raging for centuries. Okay? The reason I came down so hard last week on people who want to be teachers for all the wrong reasons is because that's my struggle. Okay? The knowledge I had either. To the man who claims to be wise, James issues the same challenge he gave to the man who claims to have faith. He says, prove it by the way that you live. Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior, his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. We've already seen that wisdom comes from God. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. Every good and perfect gift comes from him. And if you have this wisdom, the wisdom from above, then your behavior will be characterized by gentleness or meekness. To be gentle means to restrain your strength. You don't use all of your strength when you pet a kitten or a puppy or when you hold a child's hand, do you? You use only as much strength as you need to. You restrain yourself. And the weaker someone is, the more you limit your strength when dealing with them. That's the idea here. Hold that image in your mind. This concept of heavenly wisdom is very connected to this idea of gentleness. Jesus is gentle. Incredibly gentle with us. Matthew uh, 11, 29 says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Isaiah 42, 3, when he's talking about God's servant who would come, talking about the gentleness of Christ, he said, a crushed reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not extinguish. We are crushed reeds and smoldering wicks. We are weak. And he is gentle with us, knowing that weakness. He restrains his strength. This is a lesson for teachers and parents as well, not to be demanding not to be hard on people who are moving in the right direction because they're not moving as fast as we want them to. To be gentle with those under our care. Think of how patient Jesus is with us. Jesus lumps gentleness and humility together. He says, I am gentle and humble or lowly in heart. At prayer meeting this week in Psalm 18, we saw that David told God, your humility or your gentleness makes me great. Or you could say it this way, you bend down to raise me up. Whenever God deals with us, he condescends. He limits himself 
If he didn't, we would be destroyed. Jesus is our ultimate example of wisdom. And uh, just to make it clear, to define what these two wisdoms are, the wisdom from above we're going to see is focused outward. The wisdom from above is focused outward. It deals with others according to their limitations and needs. It deals with others according to their limitations and needs. The wisdom from below is focused inward. It prioritizes personal needs and is inconsiderate of others. Rehoboam was concerned about keeping his position and the respect of his subjects. That's why he acted the way he did. It was clear to everyone that his focus was not on the needs of his people. Let's keep reading and take a look at this wisdom from below. How can we recognize it? Where does it come from? And where does it lead? Let's get a running start again in verse 13. Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant. In this context, it is a spirit of fierce competition. Okay, the desire to have first place. Someone with this attitude evaluates the worth of their accomplishments by comparing them to the accomplishments of others. And when we do this, one of two things can happen. First, we can become envious of those who have greater accomplishments than we do. Or we can become proud when we consider those who have less than we do. Usually, it's a combination of both of those things. There's always going to be someone more successful and someone less successful than you. When you have selfish ambition, even the good things you do can be traced back to selfish. You show someone love because you want them to love you back. That's something we're all guilty of at some point, isn't it? If your actions are fueled by selfish desires or by a spirit of competition, then you are a liar if you claim to have the wisdom from above. Wisdom from above, like faith, like living faith, shows itself in a person's life. But wisdom from below is more covert. It doesn't he doesn't ask them to evaluate their actions here. He asks them to look at their hearts and be honest with themselves about who they are. Do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. It may not be obvious to others, or we may not think that it's obvious to others, that our focus is inward. And it may sometimes not even be obvious to ourselves. But with David, we can pray, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts, and see if there be any hurtful way in me. So where does this self-promoting kind of wisdom come from? It certainly doesn't come from God. Verse 15, this wisdom is not that which comes down from above. It's not the wisdom he was talking about in chapter 1 when he told us to ask for wisdom from God. But is earthly, natural, demonic. It's amazing how much James tells us in just three words. Earthly, natural, demonic. Earthly is the opposite of heavenly. As we know from chapter 1, those who have wisdom from God recognize that temporary earthly things have no value when compared to eternal heavenly riches. We know that this is true. We know that 
that is better than this. But we still live on earth. We naturally desire the things that we see in front of us. We naturally value the things that we can possess right now. And we naturally care about the things that will affect our lives today. If this life is the last chance we'll get to experience real pleasure and fulfillment, then it makes no sense to waste this life living for anyone other than ourselves. This self-centered wisdom comes from a perspective that is focused on the earth. Earthly is the opposite of heavenly, and natural, the second of these descriptions, is the opposite of spiritual. Natural is the opposite of spiritual. The word translated natural is psychopos, psychikis, psychopos. It's a Greek word that means between these two things. The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit. Where exactly that line is between the soul and the spirit is something people have debated forever. But uh, our soul is basically ourselves. The uh, personality, the mind, and the spirit, whatever else it may be, is the part of us that connects to God. The part of us that is dead without God. The wisdom from below ignores the spirit and focuses on the soul. Spiritual needs that only God can meet. This wisdom is natural in the sense that it only cares about the natural side of things. It leaves spiritual realities, spiritual needs, and God himself out of the equation. And when this happens, we become our own gods. And our psychiatric health becomes the highest good. People and responsibilities that do not bring us satisfaction can be cut out of our lives without remorse. When we hold this attitude. The self-centered wisdom from below is based on an attitude that focuses only on the needs of our bodies and our souls and not the spiritual realm in any sense. Practically, it's atheistic. The wisdom from below is also demonic. Those who trust in this wisdom are trusting in the lies of Satan and his minions. Our self-centeredness does not benefit others, of course, and it doesn't even benefit ourselves. So who does it benefit? Only someone who hates God and who hates humanity with his whole being and has nothing to lose. The wisdom from below comes from those who hold an earthly point of view, who ignore spiritual realities, and who believe the lies of demons. So where does this wisdom lead? What happens when the battle for the mind is lost? Verse 16. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. Disorder and every evil thing. Remember, the wisdom from above is focused outward. It deals with others according to their limitations and needs. The wisdom from below is focused inward. It prioritizes personal needs and insecure in their leadership roles. Like Rehoboam, they feel the need to defend their position by asserting their power. They do not restrain their strength in gentleness. Instead, they use excessive force. They use more strength than they need when dealing with those under them in an attempt to put down rebellion before it starts. This also works the other way. Those under authority who hold to a self-centered, earthly wisdom have a hard time submitting to authority. They desire to have first place themselves, and they are quick to ignore or oppose any instructions that they don't feel are in their best interest. 
when you put this type of leader and this type of follower together, it's only a matter of time before the order established by God is disrupted. The word disorder in verse 16 doesn't really paint a picture of a messy and disorderly bedroom. That's not the idea. It has the idea of civil disorder. Try to think of a single type of sin that cannot be motivated by self-centered thinking. Ultimately, that is the source of all sin. All is fair in self-love and the war for self-promotion. It is worth noting, though, that the world at large does not condone, uh, condone this attitude. People don't like that this is the case. Um, if you watch a movie in which a character is always struggling to be first, to put himself ahead of others, then that character is either the villain or they're going to have a change of heart at some point. Right? People understand that this is a wrong mindset. Of course, that doesn't change the fact that the film industry itself is fiercely competitive and thrives on the promotion of individuals. They acknowledge the problem, but they can't fix it. Nobody can fix it. No one likes the fact that the world is full of conflict and disorder, that we don't feel safe, that we can't trust each other. In the words of Elvis Presley, the problem faced by humanity, they recognize the problem, but they're powerless to fix it. The world longs for peace, but the world's wisdom, the wisdom from below, creates nothing but disorder and suffering. It can't create anything else. But what about the wisdom from above? We already know where it comes from. It comes from God. But how can we recognize it? And where does it lead? Verse 17, but the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. This is how we recognize the wisdom from above. It's quite a list. So uh, I apologize for that. I try to keep up. Um, the wisdom from above is first pure. First of all, it's pure before anything else. The world's way of thinking and God's way of thinking. Or between godly wisdom and sin. Sin corrupts the mind. And if we do not start with the purity of our mind, we will not be able to accept this wisdom. We have to be intentional about the things we bring into our mind. Yeah, that includes what we watch, what we read, what we listen to, what we feed ourselves. We are told to set our minds on things above, on Christ, not on earthly things. You're never going to hear me preach against a specific book or movie or TV show. Partly because I believe that doing that um, excites curiosity in those things. You could do with Jesus. Can he be there with you? Do, do you have to leave God kind of in a corner as you enjoy this thing? And if you can't bring him into this, if he can't be a part of what you're doing, don't do it. Because he always wants to be with you. He always wants to be part of what you're doing and what you're thinking. And if you know he is opposed to what you're doing, then you're not following him by doing it. Okay, and that's as much as I'm going to say about that. I'm not going to go into specifics. But we have to be pure in our mind if we want to. Have you ever known someone who is always angry about something? Who takes this a little bit more seriously? Who couldn't talk to someone they disagreed to without it turning into a fight? And who would remember those fights with bitterness years down the road? Are you either of those people? 
A wise man is not eager for conflict, but eager for peace. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's about restraining strength and more about extending goodness. Giving people what they need. It's used of authority figures more than once who are kind and fair and who pay attention to the needs of those under them. They have this kind of gentleness, this benevolence, you could say. Again, the wisdom from above has an outward focus. We should walk through life with open eyes, aware of the concerns of others. And when we see a concern, we should each ask ourselves, what would I three through four do nothing from selfish ambition or vain glory, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves, not merely looking out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. The wisdom from above is also reasonable. Reasonable. This word um, is translated a few different ways in different translations. Sometimes submissive. Or uh, the King James has easy to be entreated. I like that. And uh, yield is extremely rare. It's easy to act in a polite and humble way, but to actually be humble and submit is something else entirely. Reasonableness is the art of losing arguments with grace. The art of stepping away from a fight, of being easy to, on the authority of scripture, on the things that matter, the point is that we should be uncompromising in the real battle and not sacrifice the real battle for any other fight. Most of our arguments are not about things that we should be ignorant. Your focus is never on yourself. And this is the heart of of the issue, the truly wise man values peace more than they value victory. The truly wise man values peace more than they value victory. We're covering a lot of things at once, but if you take one thing away from this sermon, take away that phrase. Peace is more important than victory. The wisdom from above is full of mercy, and the opposite is also true. You will not be capable of genuine love or truly good works if you accept the earthly, natural, and demonic wisdom that insists you put your own needs first. We are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And these last two things go together. The wisdom from above is unwavering and without hypocrisy. Unwavering and without hypocrisy. A wise man can be relied on for two reasons. First of all, he means what he says. Sincerity. Not only does the wise man build his house upon the rock, the wise man is a rock, firm in any storm and solid to the core. You can use a lot of words to describe the wisdom from above, but at its core, it's a very basic principle. Someone who has wisdom from below is willing to sacrifice the needs of others in order to meet their own needs. Someone who has the wisdom from above is willing to sacrifice their own needs to meet the needs of others. The wisdom from below spreads righteousness or more literally, the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. When our focus is outward, we are sensitive to the needs and weaknesses of others. And when we are sensitive to their needs, when we are willing to be wronged, 
to lose arguments, to sacrifice our rights for the sake of unity. When we behave in this way, we are cultivating righteousness. This is how we fight the battle. This is how the wisdom from above can destroy the wisdom from below. Sacrificing ourselves for the sake of peace, valuing peace more than victory, is so foreign to the way a worldly wise man thinks that it shocks his system, it cracks his armor, it plants a seed. And that's how righteousness spreads. That's how our minds are opened to the possibility of another way of thinking and living. Not one of us has won this battle yet. Ever since the fall of man, self-centeredness has been the logic with which our minds are programmed. And we will never fully overcome it in this life. But we can help each other. Remember that God promises this wisdom if we ask. Wisdom from above. With his help, we can turn our focus outward and together create a field of peace. Fertile ground in which righteousness can grow. James is one of the most morally challenging and exhortation-dense books in the New Testament. And uh, we've been talking a lot about things that are frankly only directed to those who trust in Christ. Because only those who trust in Christ, who have the power of the Holy Spirit living in them, and hope to follow these exhortations and commands. In Ephesians chapter 2, it describes the state of those who are without Christ. 
the state we used to have ourselves. Ephesians 2, 1, you were dead, he says, in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world. We could say according to the wisdom of this world, the wisdom from below. According to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Following our desires did not bring us true joy or satisfaction, and we see a glimpse of what that death ultimately will be like in the book of Revelation. We were children of wrath, deserving of God's mercy, but God, I mean deserving of God's wrath, his punishment, but God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead. In our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Christians who understand God would be there still. It is by grace and grace alone, the free gift of God is eternal life. And we receive it through faith, simply by trusting in Christ, not doing good works. If we did, then we would have something to boast about. We would be able to say when we got to heaven, I got here because I did this. But we can't. It's all because of what Christ has done for us. Dying to take our place, the punishment that we deserved, and rising to give us life and a future with God. Trusting ourselves will never get us there. Trusting in Him and Him alone will. He is the only one who can save. To earn your grace. Please work in their hearts and minds this morning. Bring them to a knowledge of the truth, of their sinfulness before you, and the sufficiency of Christ. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that Christ is enough. Thank you that we have salvation in his name. And help us not to exalt ourselves above those who have not come to Christ or who have not reached the level of maturity that we have, but that we would be gentle, that we would be patient as you are with us and simply be diligent and faithful to our responsibility to share your word and to encourage one another all the more as we see that day approaching when you will come for us. Thank you for the hope, for the life, for the power that we have in you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.